Well, welcome. Um, I want to start by thanking some people who helped to make this presentation possible, starting with the Faculty Development Committee here on campus. This is the College of Our Presentation, and we are indebted to them for helping us to make it happen. Also, thanks to the English Division and to the Two Rivers Reading Series Committee, which includes Paige Reel, Michelle Heron, Scott Stanky, Jennifer Wilcutt, Kathy Y, and me. Um, I'm Tracy Youngblom Turner from the English Department, and I am pleased and honored to introduce today's speaker, Diane Wilson. As you know, she's here today to read from and talk to you about her book, Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past, a book that many of you have read and talked about in your classes. This book won a 2006 Minnesota Book Award and has been featured this year in the One Minneapolis, One Read series a particularly appropriate choice for 2012, the year that marks the 150th anniversary of the Dakota War that is at the center of this book. I must confess, I read the first few chapters of Spirit Car while in a car myself, driving with my husband to Iowa to visit relatives. I read aloud as he navigated the beautiful farmlands between here and there. We were both mesmerized by the story, a mix of fact and imagination, of family history and state history. Diane has done what many of us have wanted to do, fill in the gaps and silences in our own histories. Her book, which author Susan Power calls a generous honor song, is beautifully written. It chronicles her family's story as far back as five generations, tracing their long and troubled route through Nebraska, South Dakota, and Minnesota, while simultaneously tracing her own journey to discover the stories and the heritage that have been lost. It is a story of survival, of people, of families, of culture, of perspective. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Diane Wilson. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. I am honored to be um, on your campus and to be part of the conversation and to actually share my book with all of you. I can't tell you what an honor that is for a writer to have people care about something you, you uh, labored on in private for so many years. Um, so can I ask were, uh, if any of you were in the first presentation? So you're all new. Okay, so just I didn't want to repeat myself too much. Um, and then how many of you have read the book? So, okay, great, a lot of background. So I am actually going to today, just I'm gonna uh, read a brief section from the book. But then I also want to discuss some of the questions that um, the students turned in, which uh, I'm really grateful for, because it gave me a great insight into some of the things you think about as you read it. It gave me a way to think about the presentation from a little more from your perspective and to just shift the material around, because you know I know it pretty well by now. So um, it was really fun to get that list of questions. So I put together uh, about half a dozen, and then afterwards we'll have time where you can bring up uh, your own questions if, if we didn't get to them yet, um, and just see where the conversation goes. So just you know, for anyone who hasn't read the book, I just want to say briefly that um, Spirit Car is a memoir that I wrote about my mother's family. Um, it, it traces back five generations uh, to the 1862 Dakota War where my great-great-grandmother uh, Rosalie Ironcloud um, was living across the river from the agency when the war broke out. And I went back that far because uh, at, I actually didn't learn about the, the war or I certainly didn't remember learning about it when I was in school. I never learned anything about the removal of Dakota people afterwards. And so the history that I learned really didn't explain my family's experience. So knowing that my, um, my relative was living across the river, uh, she was married to a French Canadian, and they had, I forget, seven or eight mixed blood children. 
And the fact that when the war broke out, the Dakota people had to decide in that moment which side they were going to be on. And so she and her family took refuge at the fort, and I thought that was a pivotal decision that has everything to do with uh, the cultural identity as it shifted across generations in my family. But at the time that I started the book, I didn't know any of that. What I, um, what I had was a story that my mother had told me about being left at boarding school. Um, and when I was growing up in Minneapolis, she really, she really had, had disconnected herself from the Native community. She had, um, I used to ask her about it, and she, all she would say is, we were poor and I'm done with all that. And of course that just fueled my curiosity. But the fact that I knew that she was enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation and that she'd spent six years at a boarding school on the Pine Ridge Reservation made her life so different from mine that when I got older, I, I had to ask, well, how did this happen in one generation? And then the one story that she did tell me when I was growing up, she told um, me and my siblings each one at a time was about um, when she was at boarding school and she went home that one day to Rapid City to find her family had moved. And I was so shocked by that story and you know, I could only imagine the sense of abandonment she must have felt, except that um, you know, she never expressed that. The only thing I got from her telling me was that it was that there was some, some pain there. There was some reason why she held that story close and that she wanted to share it. It's almost like she was passing that story on, that it was something that was too big for her to understand, even though she wasn't bitter or angry, but she gave it to each of us and we took it in our own way and as a it was actually the thing that then shaped my life. I have to say that story has everything to do with how my life has become. And, and that, to me, tells you something about the power of story to us. And so that, that is the story that got me started writing. It was the first thing I wrote out of this book. It was, I sat down because I had to have a way to process it. You know, somebody else might have taken it into music, like my brother did, or or um, some other direction, or simply set it aside. But to me, I had to understand what, what happened. And then once I, once I looked at that story more closely, I realized I can't really understand my, my grandparents' decision without understanding the history around that, just to, that, the context. And I'm not a big history buff. I'm not a person who enjoys reading history. I, I always considered it as, um, this dry collection of facts that you know provided kind of an umbrella overview, but it wasn't anything relevant, I didn't think, to my own life. So I got into history trying to understand my own family. And that's that and that ultimately became a way of personalizing history, of understanding that the things you're reading in your books, in our history books, are things that happen to individual families, and that when we lose sight of that, then we're under, <clears throat> we're not able to truly understand the impact of that history, or the fact that it travels as a legacy between generations. So that's why it became so important to me to understand Rosalie's life, and then how her decision affected her children's lives, and how their decisions, and so on, affected each generation until finally it came to me and what was left was this story of my mother's and in a way I view that as a thread you know looking back that was the thread that pulled me back into the community into the culture into the into understanding this history so I'm going to read you um, a brief excerpt about um, just one of the one of the experiences I had growing up, and this is I just come back from a research trip out to South Dakota, and so I'm I'm visiting my mother in Golden Valley, and we're just having a conversation about the the road trip where my daughter said, 
and she was never going on another one with me again. <laughs> and I can't blame her. Um, so this is, the, this is part of that conversation. We sat without speaking for a few minutes, my mother in her usual chair near the toaster and the phone. She was 65, but her hair was still dark, streaked lightly with gray around her face. She liked to get up early in the morning, like before my dad, and sit quietly with her coffee, her jungle pink fingernails a bright contrast to her white cup. Like all of her sisters, she has remained a beautiful woman as she grows older, although I like to remind her that the family parakeet once found her nose with its high ridge a convenient landing place. She just tells me to look in the mirror. <clears throat> My mother, as always, was turned toward the window so she could watch the sparrows at the feeder in the front yard. Her eyes were softened with age, but they still commanded obedience from her grandchildren with a single look, just as they did from her own children. She never raised her voice with us, instead using silence like a cattle prod, nudging us to behave. Before I left, I carried a stack of folded laundry up from the basement to my mother's bedroom. The room was still pink, my mother's favorite color. A rosary hung from one corner of her dressing table, the only reminder that she had been raised Catholic. She had never attended a Catholic church while we were growing up, preferring, she said, to keep her spiritual business private. I set my mother's laundry on her dresser near a thin stack of old photographs that were pinned together with a paper clip. The top photo had been taken during a play at Holy Rosary. My mother and her closest sister wore traditional buckskin dresses for their roles as squaws. Their long dark hair had been braided and held in place with beaded headbands. A young priest stood at the end of one row of students. Many of them appeared to be mixed bloods. The photograph was one of the few reminders of my mother's Lakota heritage. She did not speak the language, never made fry bread, never asked that we attend a powwow, rarely mentioned her relatives still living in Mendota or South Dakota. Occasionally, she would get a small check in the mail as payment for reservation land that had been leased in Nebraska or South Dakota. Her silence meant that we learned about Indians by watching The Lone Ranger and Tonto on television. But one morning on a day much like this one, hot and bright and humid, she had surprised me. I was about 11 years old, dawdling in the garage out of curiosity or nose trouble, as my mother called it, waiting for the Salvation Army truck to arrive. Our summer days were so placid and uneventful that the arrival of a big truck to carry away a donated couch was an event. I was the first to see the truck backing into our driveway. I knew that curtains would be pushed open all along our street as the neighbor women craned their necks to see what was going on at the Wilson house. I stood unnoticed in the corner as two burly Indian men climbed out of the truck and walked into the garage. My mother came out the side door, a cardigan sweater thrown over her shoulders. She looked elegant even in the old slacks she wore while she cleaned. When she saw the men, she smiled and said, Hakola, hello friend in Lakota. They looked as surprised as I felt one of the men nodded his head and returned the greeting. Up until that moment, I thought my mother was the same as all the other mothers in the neighborhood. I knew about Rosebud and Holy Rosary, but they weren't real to me. My mother wore her hair cut short, drove my brothers to baseball practice in the station wagon, and showed up for parent-teacher conferences in a mom-style outfit. Standing in the garage that morning was the first time I realized she was different, not just from the neighbors, but from me. So that moment, combined with the story that my mother told me, was about all I had to get started. And so for, for those of you who are writers or interested in writing, um, 
let, let that be encouragement to you, that it doesn't take much. All you need is a question, really. So in my writing, I'm inspired by questions. I think in that, in that moment, I thought about, how did this happen to my mother? And the other question related to that was, how, what has happened to the native, to the Dakota identity in my family? How is it that her life is so different from mine? And that was at a time when I still hadn't done any of the research. So I didn't know about the 1862 Dakota War. I didn't know about boarding schools and allotment land and intermarriage and all these other policies that had been put in place for 150 years, specifically, intentionally to absorb families like mine into the broader culture. And so all I had was those two little pieces and, you know, and a question, just a curiosity. And so I started by looking at my grandparents. You know, I went backwards in time. I thought, well, I know, I knew them, and they were good people, so how did this happen that she was left for two years at boarding school? And then I started looking at boarding schools themselves. Why were they there? What was the history? What was the purpose? Why were, um, you know, in my family, they used to, her, she was told that they were lucky to have boarding schools because the, South Dakota was so depressed um, and it was so difficult to survive during the Great Depression that they could send their children there and know that they would be fed and clothed. So um, my grandmother told my mother, you know, you're lucky, you're lucky to go there because many of the white children have nothing. So that was kind of our understanding. And then, you know, I went back further into the history of boarding schools and learned about the, the critical role that they played um, starting in the late 1880s um, intended in, with an intention to assimilate Native children as being far more uh, vulnerable than their parents to adapting to white culture. And so in those early years, the, the children were removed from their homes and they were forbidden to speak their language. Their hair was cut. They were given um, different clothing to wear, uh, forbidden to practice their traditions. And this went on from the late 1880s well into the mid-1900s. So um, the approximately 100,000 Native children went through those schools. And so I was beginning to take my family's experience and put it in this broader context of history and um, then there's that story where you know I went back to Rapid City and I was at the Journey Museum and how strange it was to see my mother's photograph in the middle of that wall to understand you know to see literally that the boarding schools were part of the breakdown of Teoshpa or extended family so the it's not so what I so as I continued to work, I, I gathered all this information about my family. I, I got uh, lots of details and records and, and um, went to visit all the places where they lived. I found their graves. I, found, uh, I interviewed everybody I could think of. And then all of that went into making these stories so that they were built on as solid a bedrock of information as I could possibly acquire as a researcher. It was, it was essential to me that you understand these stories as true, even the ones that were written as recreated fiction, because the, 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 um, the purpose of the book in many ways is to give an understanding of how assimilation has worked in this country, but by telling it through the experience of a family, you can imagine it in a way in a personal way and, and imagine that emotional experience in a way that you don't get, or I sure didn't get, when I read about thousands did this and these broad movements that are pretty much stripped of any kind of personal of impact. So, so that's kind of a, in a nutshell, some of what I was thinking while I wrote that book. Um, one of the questions, so one of the questions is, was there a certain event that happened in your life that made you crave knowledge about your family's history? And that was the, the excerpt that I, that I read to you and also that story of my mother. So 
So I also want to encourage you too to think back in your own in your own families, in your own experience, if there have been moments that you wonder about, that 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 you're puzzled about, that you carry with you today, that make you wonder about who your family is or who you are or what what um, just something that hasn't hasn't been explained yet. Pay attention to those things. And then one of the questions that I really wanted to talk about is um, that what was your intention in writing this book? The record of a journey or bringing attention to focus on Native issues? And um, I really think that intention for a writer, especially a writer of nonfiction or creative nonfiction, is a really critical question. And I didn't know it, again, starting out. I was just gathering information. I wasn't even sure I was going to write a book because that seemed impossible. So, um, so when I started out, it was just about understanding my family. But as I gathered this information, especially about the history, and started understanding and putting it together in this broader context, my intention began to change. And then when we got to the, the question of how is this book going to go together, then intention becomes a really critical question because how you put the form together has to reflect your intention towards the reader. So what I mean by that is, starting out, I had my family story that I wanted to learn. So there's my narrative, which is me starting here and moving backwards in time and uncovering all this information back to the 1862 Dakota War. And then there is the actual story itself that you read in book one that starts at 1862 and moves all the way forward. And in trying to put those two narratives together um, was really a challenge. And so I had to wrestle with that question, what is it I'm trying to do? What is it, what's my intention in writing this book? It's no longer just about my family. We're not that, um, we don't have a, a, a big colorful history. We don't have all these, you know, known, we're pretty ordinary in many ways, except for the having lived through <laughs> some fairly extraordinary history. So we're a humble family. So telling my family story is, you know, that's not headline making. So what I looked at is the bigger story that my family's experience is telling is about assimilation. And to understand assimilation, you have to see how it works from one generation to the next. So you have to look at the 1862 Dakota War and the fact that after that war, and the aftermath to me is far more significant than actually what even happened during the war, but after the war, the Dakota were removed from the state. First they were marched, the women, children, and elders were marched from Lower Sioux to Fort Snelling and, and then imprisoned there until they were removed to South Dakota the following spring. The men were imprisoned at Mankato, where 38 were hung, and then the rest sent down to Fort Davenport, uh, Fort McClellan in Davenport, Iowa. And so I looked at those events, and I looked at the fact that you've got Dakota people removed from the state completely. In that first three years at Crow Creek in South Dakota, 600 children died of starvation and malnutrition. So then you've got the loss of most of a generation. And so you take what is this unbelievable trauma that the Dakota have experienced, the loss of the homeland, the loss of a generation, and you roll that forward because it's not resolved. It's not, nothing has been done to ease the pain of that or, or reconcile the suffering. And then you roll that into the next generation when the boarding school started. And then you have that continuing for the next, uh, up through the mid-1950s, and so you have generation after generation experiencing um, trauma that is not resolved in any way. And all of it directed towards children in ways that um, are intended to assimilate them. And so that's where I look at this, this so the story that I'm trying to tell through this is that story of assimilation, but in a way that you as a reader can absorb it, that you don't, that you don't um, 
feel overwhelmed with facts, that you feel it as a personal story because history happened to real people. So if you were out there on that march after, during the removal, how would it feel to you if it was you on that march, if it was your child, if it was your mother? And so that was, the, that was what I was trying to get to by telling my family's story in this way. Um, <clears throat> and so that intention created the form that you read. That's why it rolls the way it does in two books. The reason I kept my story interspersed was so that you were on one timeline, but you didn't forget about this second timeline. And then I could bring them together at the end. Um, <clears throat> I got this from Jeffrey Eugenides Middlesex because it was a real struggle to figure out a way to tell this story. I had pieces, I had stories here, I had interviews there, I had something in the middle over here, and I, you know, I showed this to the editor, and she said, wow, how are you ever going to put that together? <laughs> and I really didn't know. So that's where that question of intent, once I understood, I'm trying to tell the story of assimilation that has to work on a timeline. I took all those pieces and I put them in order. And then that helped me, that helped me figure out a form for the book. And as I told the earlier group, it still took a year before that manuscript was accepted. So the editor read that, what I had put together, which a student, uh, she made a good a comparison to a quilt. That's kind of how it went together. But she looked at that and she said, well, you know, we're really interested. We'd like to publish this, but it's, you know, the man manuscript's not ready. So I took it back and I re reorganized it, put it back together, gave it to her again. She read it and she said, well, you know, we're still interested, but this one doesn't work quite as well as the first one. So then, <clears throat> okay, you can't get discouraged because writing is all about rewriting. And this is how we learn to do books, by doing them. So then I took it home with me, and I thought, okay, I read a lot of fiction, actually, and studied how they put it together, the craft of fiction, meaning how did they structure the paragraphs? How did they work with the length of sentences? How did they go from one chapter to the next chapter? How do mystery writers sustain dramatic tension from the beginning to the end of a book. I looked at all of, the, primarily fiction, because that's where the storytelling is, and I wanted this to be a true story. So then I went back through it, and I worked, I put it back to the original format, and I reworked all of that, and I gave it to her, and then, then she accepted it. And then, of course, that's only the beginning of your editing process. So then, during the editing process, <clears throat> um, one of the places, when we had a lot of questions to work through, but one of the places we really had a challenge was in the, t the chapter towards the end of the book, when I'm on the march, and it goes from present time back in time. And she was, my editor was adamant that that should be cut. She said, you, you haven't done any other areas with this kind of magic realism approach. The reader's not going to be ready for it. It's too big of a leap to take. And I said, you know, the experience I had on that march, this is how it felt. We, we left. We, the, time, the times collapsed. We were both in past and present. And I don't know any other way to explain it, but this is how it has to be. And um, I think at that point, it was part of the process of taking what had been for me an intellectual search, a lot of research, a lot of interviewing, you know, it's kind of safe, hiding behind your facts. But when you get to that emotional impact of these events, of this history, when you internalize it as your own family, then that's what was happening in that chapter. So that was the experience I had on the march of, of recognizing this is my family that has had this history and then trying to then portray that in writing. But here's, this was another really good lesson to come out of that process, is that sometimes other people are going to fight you on what is really important to you in your art. 
and you have to be rigorous in questioning yourself first of all the importance of it but then defending it when it really matters whether it's music literature painting any of those things you defend what is essential to that to the essence of your story and that was one of those moments and I have to say of all the places in the book that people respond to me that's the area that probably gets more more comment than any other place and it's especially from Native people. When they read it, they just say, yeah, that's how it is. And so I thought, well, thank God I didn't you know, listen to the other. I listened to her on a lot of other things, but not that one place. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Someone else asked, did writing the book affect your opinion on American history? Yes, a great deal. Um, I think really there's, there's so much history that has gone untold in our country and even in our state. You know, that what has happened in Dakota history within Minnesota and, and certainly throughout the country um, qualifies under the United Nations definition of genocide. And yet, here we are, it's a history that has been poorly taught. And so you have to see that as having been covered up and who has benefited from not sharing this history. So to me, the real important aspect of this year, this 2012 150th anniversary of the, of the Dakota War, is the fact that people are paying attention. People are learning the history. The Star Tribune did a great series. And we're beginning to understand that we have inherited a really complex legacy within Minnesota and within our country. And we really haven't come close yet to, to understanding the, the impact of that history, much less to reconcile around it. And to me, the, the history of the boarding schools, that's one of the, that's one of the biggest stories to have come out of Native history to have impacted so many lives, and yet we haven't really even acknowledged it. And they have in other countries, up in Canada, They've done, um, they've, they, they, uh, they had an apology from their highest level of government. They um, passed a, a restitution package of some 350 million, which money does not solve these issues. But it was a government attempting to make something right that it had done horribly wrong. And so, um, so Spirit Car is a way of sharing a story that begins to raise this conversation up to a place where we can share it, where we can begin to think about our histories, uh, what we've inherited, uh, what you've inherited in your own lives, um, you know, people who've grown up in those areas around where the war uh, took place. Certainly there's a lot of feelings that are still very strong in all of those areas. So, um, so I'm, that's why I'm really grateful to events like this where we can you're, you're reading the book, we have the conversation. Uh, I love hearing the feedback on what you thought. Um, and so, and I love getting these questions. Um, and someone asked, how has your life changed after writing the book? Well, when I started out, I, you know, I didn't really know anything about my family, about writing. Um, uh, I was working in the arts, uh, uh, for many years in arts organizations, which I love. But um, in writing the book, I understood that the silencing of these stories was not just my family's decisions to not be connected to their culture. It had a great deal to do with the history that they were living through and that the, um, the so that they had actually, that that a lot of these policies come from a very uh, oppressive mindset. And so that it felt to me, once I knew that history, I had a responsibility, not only to my family to share what, what they had lost, but also back to the community and then, you know, and, and communicate in whatever way I can that an, uh, an injustice has been done um, to Native people in, in many ways and, and that, um, and it affected all of us. So I, it shaped, so writing a book was a huge thing. And let me just tell you all that it's a lot of work, but it can be done. 
you just get up every morning and you write and you do it whenever you have the chance and you learn to do it by doing it. You don't, nobody has a magic formula. So you can write books. Um, and then, and then I wrote a second one, which was, you know, just as, seemed just as unfathomable to me as the first one, because you forget, well, how do I do that? <laughs> and um, so writing a second one helped deepen my understanding of the issues that really just got introduced in Spirit Card. And then, and then finally, it did shape also the work that I do in my life, so that I have been volunteering for many years for a, a native owned farm called Dream of Wild Health where we have a collection of really old rare seeds that uh, belong to tribes. Some of them are just hundreds of years old. We have 800 year old tobacco. Um, and then we also have educational programs for native teens um, and families that help them learn uh, healthier lifestyles because uh, diabetes is epidemic in the native community. And so um, this work for me is a, is a wonderful outcome of actually a process that began with that question about trying to understand who my family is. So once I knew, I thought, well, all right, now it's my turn. I'm of that age where uh, it's my responsibility to both hold this legacy for our family and do what I can in my lifetime to make a difference. So um, that's, in a, in a long way, uh, a way of talking about the power of story to shape who we become. So I would like to open this up now to questions. Um, and I hope you all be brave. I would love to hear. One of the questions I asked the first group is, um, what did you think, what did you think the main point was? That's one thing I'm interested in hearing about, but I'm also just interested in any questions you have, anything I haven't answered today. Yes? Um, can I help uh, notice that there's the 150th anniversary is coming up, but is there anything for that for the march? Yeah, there will be, he asked about the, um, whether the march will be happening, yes. And this will be the last official march, as far as I know. Um, so it will it will take place just as it has in years past. So who would like to share um, that question I just asked? What what did you think the main point of the book was? What or what was it for you? What was the thing that you got out of it? Yeah. basically camouflaged at best. And I was astonished at the kind of atrocities that were experienced during that particular time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else see that too? Yeah. Well, what, and what concerns me about that, when, you know, when you're not getting um, a, a broader, more diverse view of history, that, you know, I looked at um, the way that, you know, talking about the trauma that's been passed between generations. So what happens when you have all that unresolved trauma is that it results in um, a lot of social ills like uh, high rates of alcoholism, which, you know, um, there is in the community, the native community, high rates of diabetes, high rates of uh, depression, and also, you know, natives, native teens have the highest rate of suicide in country. And so if you are not familiar with the history, you think, well, that's Native people. They, you know, that's who they are. And so you begin to see those stereotypes 
um, those statistics as a stereotype of Native people. You um, begin, you know, and maybe it's not such a far step then to create a mascot or um, or discriminate, you know, you, you discriminate against people in subtle ways through housing, through education. And so um, part of my concern in, in telling a broader story is that you really understand who people are and that when this history occurred, it affected both sides. It wasn't just, the harm wasn't just on one side. Um, to create a, a society that that in which this is capable of happening harms everyone. And so, um, and so to have that, one of the things that um, Clifford Chanku, who is a spiritual leader up at Sisseton, one of the things that he, he, uh, he told me when I interviewed him is that this 150 years is a very short time in Dakota history, even though it was intensely traumatic and there's a lot of work to be done at the end of it. He said, that's not who Dakota people are. And so all the attention that's paid to these, uh, what is sometimes symptomatic of trauma and also the war, we still haven't gotten back to understanding what Dakota culture is. And that's, you know, Dakota people have been here for thousands of years. So when we talk about the healing from the trauma and reconciliation, it's really about Dakota people getting reconnected to the culture itself in terms of the language, which is in danger, um, to the ceremonies and traditions. And a lot of those are still going on today, you know, among the, at the powwows and on the reservations, but we have a lot of work to do to overcome this legacy of trauma. So telling the history, understanding the history, working together is one of those, to me, one of the first steps, making sure that it's taught in our schools so that you're not just getting a history from a perspective of manifest destiny, where this was all meant to happen, it was ordained by the church, and um, you know, and, and let's look honestly at where we where we're at and what we've done. Yes. What, what have been your mother's reaction to the writing of this? Um, she was, you know, she was my, my biggest concern when I started. So that story about the boarding school was the first one that I wrote um, when I was just starting out to write. And it was just a way of processing it. And then I showed it to her because I thought, if I'm going to go any further, she has to be in favor of this. If it feels too painful, you know, I would never have written this book. So she read it. And she said, well, that feels right. And then, you know, and she was completely open to the process from that point on. So I'd go out on these trips, and I'd meet people, and I'd write a story, or I'd do an interview, and I'd bring it back, and I'd show it to her. And so she got to learn along with me. And she would correct sometimes, like, you know, my, my grandmother, I didn't have a I didn't have a complete understanding of her personality, and so she would correct me. But mostly, she just read it, and she. So it was a, it was really a wonderful experience to share with her. And I know I'm lucky that way because there's, you know, uh, there are families that are more vested in having to cover things up because there's there's pain there, or there's unresolved issues, or there's secrets. And of course, you know, telling those stories is an entirely different kind of project. But again, to go back to that question of intention around what you're writing, um, <clears throat> one of the examples I like to talk about is Nicole Helgut's book, Summer of Ordinary Ways. And it was published a year before mine, and her family was outraged. They said it was not true, and it was such a big uh, controversy, it made the front page of the Start or the Pioneer Press. And I looked at that as a cautionary tale for telling family stories, but at the same time, because none of us as readers will really know the truth of their family, what would matter to, the, to her as a writer was what was her intention in telling those stories? Because maybe there is so much dysfunction that telling it is a way of cutting through it, you know, and then it's truth telling, and you're doing it for a good purpose. If you tell family stories to get even, you know, that's 
that's, um, that's going to create a whole new world of hurt. So intention, again, is really critical to the writer in understanding what it is you're going to put out in the world before you put it out there. Because once it's out there, you don't get to take it back. And, you know, and that was another, that, that's another thing to be aware of when writing families, family memoir. Yeah, so I was lucky. Yeah. Oh, the other side hand. That was hair. <laughs> yeah. You were on your interviews. Who was your favorite person to actually sit down and interview? Well, I have to say that um, it wasn't a great interview, but that experience I had with Buck Mullen down in South Dakota, where he didn't want to talk to me, um, that was one of the that was one of the funniest interviews that I had. And then and I you know and then to see just to see myself not realizing well he was going to talk to me, so I didn't realize I was quite so stubborn and you know until I met up with him and thought well no I'm going to sit here until you. You all turn around and look at me. So <clears throat> stuff like that was actually, that made it hugely entertaining. Um, the fun interviews, you know, the sitting down with my mother and the aunts, the fact that I had all four of them in one place at one time, and they'd all been to boarding school, and now, looking back, there's only one aunt still alive, and my mother has passed, and so I just think, I, I'm so grateful that I sat down with them when I had that opportunity. And that's something that I like to encourage everyone. You know, you're, you, it seems like your relatives will be around forever, but, but this is when you probably still have your grandparents. You may even have your great-grandparents, your aunts and uncles. And the more you can take that time to listen to them, to understand the stories that are coming down to you, the, the oral tradition that um, if you don't listen now, you may you it may you may lose another chapter in your life. Um, that was just that was the the interview I'm most grateful for. Yeah. Would you have done like the whole traveling around and discovering your past thing if it was on your dad's side of the family or something different? You know, the, um, she asked about my dad's side. Um, I didn't feel that need because history has been written from the European settler perspective. So I felt like in a way, well I don't have I don't have the family history yet for his side, but that overall history has been written. And so the the story, my mother's story felt silenced. And so I wrote that so I just was drawn to that. Um, to understand that, and the more I understood, then the more actually I just the I the connection I felt to the work I was doing um, has felt more compelling than than um, than that side, even though it's as important in my family. And it's time. So thank you all for coming today and being part of this conversation. Really, really glad to be here.